But look at this. If you were to lay all the carbon dioxide America produced last year, just America, and laid it as a blanket around the world, it would be a, th a third of a meter thick across the entire surface of our globe. Does it matter? That much carbon dioxide as a blanket? Yes, it does. How much? We have no idea. Much of this science is controversial. Why? Because we've been tracking carbon dioxide levels in real time for less than a few decades. But our surface of our world is hundreds of millions of years old. Here we have a graph, as you've seen this graph before, but we want to unpack it because there's controversy here and there's big unexplained questions. Here is a graph that shows, or attempts to show, carbon dioxide and Earth temperature running in parallel. The, car the, uh, the, uh, the carbon dioxide levels are easy to do, as you know. All you do is you take a big drill, you drill down through ice. You cut them into slices, this ice, and each slice is a year or two, or a decade, or a hundred years. You analyze the level of carbon dioxide in each slice, and you plot it out. And you get a very nice graph um, of uh, a carbon dioxide, which is in red here. That's easy. There's no controversy about that. The next piece is much more controversial, in a way, because it's harder to understand, which is to try and get an estimate of Earth's temperature going back a million years. This graph just goes back to 450,000 years, but attempts have been made to push it back further. How do you do that? In the ice is water, of course. Ice is water. All water is is H2O, hydrogen, two atoms to one atom of oxygen. And those hydrogen isotopes are different, the balance of them is different, depending on the temperature at which the ice was formed. It's complicated science. You say, well, how do we know? We know this because we've got other evidence. We've got other ways of telling what the temperature has been more recently, in the last 500, 5,000 years. And so we can plot from that a, a, a kind of a measure. And we could see a good relationship between these different types of water and different temperatures. And if you go back, something dramatic happens. If you plot one lot on top of the other, you get this extraordinary connection, which appears to show that Earth temperature fits very well with carbon dioxide over millions of years. It also appears to show this, that at the level we are at the moment, we are already off any recorded scale that there has been in human history for the last million years. So when we're saying we have no idea what the impact is, we really don't. Even if, someone, even if a scientist had been alive for the last million years, he'd have to scratch his head today and say, I'm afraid I can't tell you anything about the future because we've never seen this condition before in my lifetime. So of course there's uncertainty. And there's another big problem with this graph. It should show that carbon dioxide changes, starts to rise. And about 10, 1,500 years later, temperature starts to rise. But in fact, for reasons that scientists can't explain, it appears that at many points in this graph, the opposite happens. The temperature shifts first, and carbon dioxide second. And that is a fundamental scientific challenge with this graph. You need to know that. Now, I happen to think that the science linking to the general theory, linking carbon dioxide to human activity, to climate change, is very strong and compelling. But it's not 100%. But, what I say is this. Whatever your views on the science, you know, I would say they are irrelevant. All this is here is a best guess by scientists about what your grandchildren's world will be like in 2050 when most of these scientists are dead. But our purpose today was not to look at life in 2050. Our purpose today is to try to understand where business, government and innovation will go in the next 3 to 20 years, correct? 
And that will not be determined by the science. It will be determined by the one word which will drive the future, which is emotion. So if you want to know the near-term answer, forget about the science. The science, as I say, will just tell you the long-term future. All we need to think about is this. What does the general public think when they see Al Gore's video? When they see him talking about that growth? What does the general person in Switzerland or in this local canton, what policies will they vote for? What governments will they insist on? What taxation environment will they want to encourage? And what products and services will they buy? What will they think about uh, your company, Ernst, if it was, was a major polluter in terms of gases, of carbon dioxide, compared to yours, which for the exactly the same activity uses half the amount of energy? What will be the attitude? And uh, it's clear that there's more passion than there has ever been on this issue. It is growing. I know we've been distracted over the last 18 months, but the fundamental issues haven't gone away. Um, and this issue is here to stay. So how can we save more than 20% of global emissions? Well, here's a nice easy way to do it. I'll just show you a quick list and we'll go through some of these things. Because this problem is fixable. Uh, if we look at, uh, at the uh, Stern Review, which was done uh, uh, just a couple of years ago, he estimated that it would cost 1% of global GDP to stabilize CO2 levels at around 450 parts per million, which is uh, parts per billion, which is uh, up from what it is, to, parts per million, which is up uh, significantly from what it is now. Uh, he said the cost would be 1% of global GDP. It sounds an awful lot, but actually it's only the equivalent of, uh, suppose the global economy was growing this year. I know it probably won't, but suppose it was going to grow by 2%. All it means is that for the next 12 months, it only grows by 1%, and then carries on forever at normal rate. That's all it means. So could it be done? Yes, it could. Uh, he, this, is, this is an example of how uh, heat pumps, and we'll look at this, this could save 2% of global emissions. Carbon capture, 3.6%. Electric cars, 0.5%. Low energy street lamps, 2%. Different kinds of cement. 1%, wind power, 5%, solar, 5%, aviation efficiencies, 1.5%, 1% on, on shipping, easy. I'm just going to show you some quick examples of how today's technology, without much innovation at all, applied through your businesses, how those things could totally transform um, energy use in the developed world with a significant impact on global energy use. And then you can use your imagination to think about tomorrow. So here is an example. Let's have a look at consumption. Um, if we, uh, let's take buildings. One of the biggest uses of energy is putting buildings up and pulling them down. It makes me uh, <laughs> angry to think about. Look at these buildings here. Uh, one of them in the middle has been there for much longer than the others. And I wonder which buildings will still be around in this city of Melbourne in 20 years' time. I'm pretty sure this one will be, but I'm not sure about the other ones. I suspect, see, I talk to many people who design buildings. I talk to many people who manage industrial HQs and banking HQs, and they all tell me the same, which is that their HQs are only built to last for around 30 to 35 years. They're actually designed to fall to bits. There's no point in building the building to last longer than that because it's never going to be up that long. And I think, hey, hey, we live in a house which is 120 years old. The beautiful Schloss here has been sitting for 400 years. 400 years. What do you think its life expectancy is at this point, Prabhu? Depends how well it's maintained, but another 400 years, why not? I think it could be around for another 10,000 years. Could be. <laughs> if it's I'm wondering what would cause it to fall down. It's on rock. It's built of stone. I'm sure it could be forever repaired. So we have a building that can be built for 400 years. Put your hands up if you live in a building that is more than 50 years old. Put your hands up if you live in a building that's more than 100 years old. You know, these things are beautiful. They acquire a history. So why is it that commercial buildings are only built for 30? For me, it's an absolute scandal. 30%, 30% 
30% of all building energy use is wasted putting it up and pulling it down. If you could add even a decade onto the life expectancy of the average commercial building in Zurich, you'll have a dramatic effect on building energy use. If you could add 20 to 30 years, even more. Now let me show you something else. It's not just the pulling down, it's the disposal, the sheer wastefulness of the whole thing, because almost every molecule of this building will be trashed. Hardly anything will be usable again. Look at concrete. Concrete. The use of concrete is responsible for up to 7% of all emissions of CO2 in the world today. Put your hands up if you knew that. It's a lot. Half of it is produced when you heat the ingredients to a very high temperature, but half is produced when you actually add water and the gas comes out. And yet this is entirely avoidable, almost entirely avoidable. Half of it's avoidable anyway. If you use a, a mixture of waste from a local coal-fired power station, if you mix in waste from a plastics factory and other things like that, you can get that energy loss down by 50%. That carbon dioxide release down by 50%. Geopolymers are used. Uh, they were pioneered by the University of Mel uh, Melbourne. They are being trialed in all kinds of places. So let's do the maths. 7% of global emissions is concrete use. Let's, save, let's see if we could save 10% of the construction energy in new buildings. If we used uh, uh, e-polymer concrete in 50% of concrete, that would save 1 billion tons of carbon dioxide in 10 years. We'd save 2 to 3% of global emissions in one go, with potential sales in the EU of $5 billion. Anyone interested in that business? It's a local business, by the way. The Chinese can't compete with the Swiss. That's good news. This is local, heavy-duty, transported over a short distance. It's the retooling of every concrete production facility in Switzerland and across the whole of the European Union. What about heat pumps? Heat pumps are fabulous. They're such an, a brilliant way to heat homes. And Switzerland has been right at the forefront of this technology. You know what it is. It's just a fridge motor in reverse. Fridges pump heat to the radiator at the back and they freeze your food. But if you put it the other way around, then it cooks your food and freezes your house. Well, you put a long trail of pipe across the field outside uh, the Schloss here, and you run it. And the field gets cold, much colder than usual, so it absorbs heat from the air, which is then sucked into the Schloss or into this building, and this building heats up. If you're heating your home today by oil delivered to your house through Swiss Valley, we can reduce your energy bill, for sure, by around 50%, with a payback period of 15 years, even if we install it in an old house. If we put it into a new building, the cost falls almost to zero, and we can capitalize the cost so it's just built into the construction, and we sell a building with huge insulation, very low energy costs, very efficient. Nice business. Let's have a look at the cost of it in terms of market value. Well, it's huge. I think I have calculated that the heat pumps alone, just the machines, the pumps, is a 30 billion a year market. Where does that come from? Let's look at the maths in my country. If just half the UK homes in the next 20 years, half of them, were required by law, it could be easy. The government could decide it tomorrow. What would it cost the UK government to make that decision? Zero. What would it cost the construction industry to implement it? Zero because they just loaded a little bit onto the sales price. Would it cause a collapse in real estate prices? I doubt it. It could happen tomorrow. And you know what? Things that could happen tomorrow have a tendency to happen. So if half UK homes in the next 20 years, how many is that? That's 50,000 units. Suppose we retrofitted. We went back to install it in just 1% of old homes each year, and then straight away, we'd be talking about um, uh, uh, another 250,000 homes. That's 300,000 total installations, heat pump sales, 10 to 15 billion in the UK alone. Now you see why my figure of $30 billion for heat pump technology in the European Union is looking a little conservative. Question, who here is investing in heat pump technology? One, two, three. 
You just decided, madam. <laughs> okay, here's another one. Uh, I, this is courtesy of Johnson Controls, who I worked with recently. Fascinating company, but you could do the same business. Uh, they reckon they can go into any old office block in Zurich and do a deal. And the deal goes a bit like this. They come along and they say, John, you're the manager of this office block, 20-story high building. It's more than 10 years old. And you say, yes. So we're going to do a deal with you. We're going to give you all these things for free. We're going to give you an energy audit, full energy consulting, a systems design. We're going to come in and completely reinstall new air conditioning control systems. We may replace some of the basic equipment. We may change some of the ducting. We will install it and train your people. And what is more, we will charge you zero. And he says, what's the catch? <laughs> and you say, John, just show me one of your electricity bills for the last year. Here it is. Well, this is the good news and the bad news. The good news is that we're going to save 30% off this annual bill every single year. The bad news is you're going to pay us a check for exactly that amount for the first three years. After that, the savings are yours. Who wouldn't sign on that kind of deal? This is the, what they call a no-brainer. This is a, something you have to do. It would be negligence not to accept such an offer, would it not? It's a wonderful business model. Is it growing? You bet it is. Sure. Now, of course, if oil prices continue to be only $1.25 a barrel, they're stuffed. But let's assume that energy prices are at a reasonable level. That model works. And we'll go on working. This is a fantastic business model. And you could apply this kind of offer to many of the examples we're talking about. Wait. Oh, gosh. Let me try show you another one. Um, you can see why I think this is solvable. You've got... I'm going to go, I've only got time to show you about 15 ideas. I could show you 10,000. Every one of them is just waiting for someone like you to wake up and turn it into a wonderful business reality that incidentally will help save the world at the same time. Uh, here's another one, green roofs. Okay, maybe it's not such an exciting concept, but it looks nice. Green roofs, do they matter? Yes, they do. At uh, the roof temperature on a green roof is up to 30 degree, uh, up to nine, sorry, it's up to 30 degrees centigrade lower on the roof of Chicago Town Hall. Up to 30 degrees lower surface temperature on that roof than without a green roof. And what is more, in all the streets around that building, it's nine degrees cooler. So it's been a community benefit. You know that for every single degree you turn down the thermostat in this building, you save 10% of energy cost. So what happens when you reduce your roof temperature by 30 degrees centigrade? It's significant. Um, and uh, uh, there's been rapid take-up, therefore, in California of green roofs. In Toronto, they calculated that if 8% of uh, buildings were green roofed, it would lower the heat island by, uh, by, by about 2 degrees. 12% of German roofs on new buildings are already green. Tokyo, it's 20% of new roofs. They think in Tokyo, if 50% of all roofs are green, it will save $1 million a day of Tokyo businesses in cooling costs. Here's another no-brainer. Streetlights. Streetlights are so wasteful of electricity. A full 5%, that's 1 in 20, of all the units of electricity across the whole of America is wasted just lighting streets. I say wasted, not all of it, half of it. Because we can reduce that 5% of electricity down to only 2% of national electricity use. And how much it costs? Zero. Why? We can do another deal. Say, um, what's your name? Sorry. <coughs> Linear. Say, Linear, you're responsible for the lighting of uh, Zurich. And you say, yes. I said, here's the deal. Here is the deal. I will come and install all your lights for free. I will take away all the old lights. 
I will wire all of them up. I will do all the surveys. It will cost you nothing. And you say, what's the catch? And you say, show me your electricity bill. Here's the deal. You pay me all the energy savings for the first five years. And then for the sixth year, that's my profit. And the seventh, eighth, ninth, and up to twentieth is yours to keep. It's a no-brainer. Okay, needs an angel investor or someone to provide the capital to do it and get it off the ground. But it's another self-funding story. Okay, so the cost, what's the size of this market? The cost to replacing all 120 million European Union streetlights will be $300 billion, saving $50 billion a year in electricity at 2008 prices. So that for me is a market of $50 billion a year over 15 years. Put your hands up if you're interested in that market. <laughs> I say, let's wake up. Our LED low voltage lights, I'm not even going to go there. Just go, go and Google it. Just have a think about it. But technology isn't always good news. Look at this one. This is horrific. Plasmas. Put your hand up if you own a plasma screen in your home. Bad news. In the United Kingdom, uh, well, research has shown that plasma screens use up to four times the amount of electricity of the old, big, heavy TV. If all the UK plasma screens were turned on at once to watch the same TV program, Prabhu, we would need to install two and a half new nuclear reactors just to cope. Wow. So you can see that there's been some pretty bad planning going on here. Uh, can it be dealt with? Yes. The internet, by the way, is a challenge to us. It's already 5% of global energy use. That's about 10% of American energy use. It's 1 trillion kilowatt hours. You know what that's the equivalent of? Imagine 1 billion people in the world today all running a fan heater in their home for a full hour. That is the amount of power that the internet used last year. And every molecule was wasted as heat. And we're expecting web traffic to increase by 40 to 100 times in the next 15 years. My goodness. Global servers, servers like Google search engines, they are using already 1% of all global power, and we've only just started the digital revolution. This is a huge area for just about every technology innovation you can imagine. And one of the first things you do is you start a new business, Pierre, and you know what your business is? It's a removals business. You say, we can move your servers. And you say, Spain is a crazy place to put servers. Do you know a single server farm puts out enough energy to heat 5,000 homes. See, we have to waste, you know, for, do you know that for every euro you spend powering your servers, you spend another half a euro getting rid of the heat. So what we do is our removal service is going to move all the servers in Spain to the north of Scandinavia. <laughs> and in case you think I'm joking, I'm not. It's a boom industry now in uh, in places like Aberdeen, Inverness, and the northernmost tip of the United Kingdom. They're going to become massive houses for server farms. All you do is open the windows and let nature do its work. But the weather is so terrible there that everything happens automatically. <laughs> now, so it's better cooling, fiber optics, virtual servers. That's, what is that? That's a, that's a mechanism where you have, oh, you have a server running one program. How wasteful is that? With virtual servers, you put it all in the cloud. So you, you, uh, you don't do any of the server stuff yourself. It's housed on machines which are running 50 or 60 or 100 different programs. And if any of them gets overloaded, they start up another machine. Room, and it comes up in two or three minutes. So the, the amount of machines in that server farm goes up or down, depending on the day or night and how many businesses in this room are doing busy things. And you save a huge amount of electricity. I could go on. Here's another example, electric cars. Now, I know electric cars are controversial because they all run on coal. Hydrogen cars run on coal. Why? Because you've got to use electricity to split the hydrogen, put it into, a, uh, into, the, into the car, and so on. 
So, of course, in, in France, they're in a good position because 70% of all the miles driven in electric cars, 70% in France are nuclear-powered miles. So, electric cars forces us to think more creatively about generation on an industrial scale. So, that's why I'm in favor of them. Um, and also, they can be much more efficient than burning petrol. Petrol is a last century idea. To burn petrol in your own furnace, to make heat, to move parts, just put a little electric motor on each wheel, and you can go from naught to 60 miles per hour in less than three and a half seconds. Uh, and so, electric cars, a big deal. Size of it? Well, have a look at this. 20%, you could get a 20% energy saving perhaps in 20% of vehicle miles driven in developed nations, easily. That's one-fifth of cars being electric within the next 20 years, only one in five. That would be a 4% saving in motoring cost. That would reduce 0.5% of global emissions. That's worth thinking about. And it's battery technology that will do it. Aviation efficiency. Hmm. Put your hands up if you've been on a plane recently which had wings like that, not like that. Wings like that. Every time you get on a plane like that, you should write a letter of complaint. Because wings like that are wasting 5% of the aviation fuel compared to wings like that. And it costs only $100,000 per plane to fit it out. So that's just simple stuff. I'm not, talking about, I'm not talking about rocket science here. This is simple innovation. Shipping efficiency, easy to do that. It's just a streamlining of the hull, a change of the shape of the propeller, a redesign of the, of the, of the, uh, the, the steering mechanism, and you can save, and a bit of tweaking in the engine, and you can save 20% of all shipping energy costs straight away. 5% um, of global emissions is, is shipping, that's 1% global emissions using today's technology. I wanted to get the idea here. I'm not talking about innovation here. I'm talking about history. I'm talking about yesterday's technology and just using what we've got. The fact is that yesterday's technology is hardly being used, as we saw with street lamps and things like that. And then I'm asking you to use your imagination and begin to think about what tomorrow's next generation technologies could do. Here's another example. Some of you are manufacturers. This is Lafarge Plasterboard. It's a small company. They save 15% of their energy every year. 1,600 tons of carbon does not sound a lot, but it's the same as 370 cars in their town. That's significant. If you multiply that up by a million small businesses, you start to see significant results. And this is a very nice business if you're in energy consulting. It's low level, payback's nice, it looks good on the annual report, the community loves you, and so on. 400,000 cost, payback time five years. It's another no-brainer. Um, who is another wonderful example? I love this example. This is British sugar. <laughs> British sugar is in the process. Uh, it heats sugar, uh, heats sugar beet up and makes sh a granulated sugar. But they use a gas turbine to do it. They run North Sea gas into the gas turbine um, and that makes electricity which powers the whole thing. They collect the heat from the gas turbine to cook the sugar. And then they thought of another neat trick. This gas turbine is just the same as an, as, a, as an aircraft engine. And you've got a gas coming out of the back of it at very high speed, at a very hot temperature. They've already cooled it down, but you've got all this carbon dioxide. So what they did was they connected a pipe two and a half kilometers long. And they put it into one of Europe's largest greenhouses, where there just happened to be growing 35 million tomatoes. And the yield, the yield has doubled. So British sugar is now growing 70 million tomatoes a year instead of 35. What a wonderful thing. So what kind of business are they in? I thought they were in the business of processing sugar cane, but they've become one of the largest tomato producers in the world just by using carbon. Wonderful. So you are eating in those tomatoes, and I'm sure you will have eaten some of them, because 70 million tomatoes is even enough for Switzerland too. <laughs> it's a lot of tomatoes. So the tomatoes you've been eating has come straight out of the exhaust 
of, a, of an aviation engine, a gas turbine burning North Sea gas. Wonderful. Tremendous. I know it doesn't stay in your body very long, and then you excrete it as carbon dioxide, but at least it had a longer journey back into the atmosphere than otherwise. <laughs> now, smart power regulation, you're going to hear a lot about this one. Let me explain why. Look at this. I was in Australia recently. 40% of Australian energy is used to heat, cool, and light buildings. And we've seen how air conditioning is 7% already of greenhouse gases and how we can improve that using Johnson Controls type technology. But look at this. This is a shocking fact. On a very hot day, and there are only four of them a year, peak electricity jumps by 57%. That's a massive strain on the national grid. And it, 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 they would have severe power outs, brown outs, collapses, if it wasn't for one thing. Australian generators keep 10% of all their power stations on standby for just four days a year. Imagine that. One in ten of all Australian power stations do absolutely nothing to help the country except for 72 critical hours every 12 months and those are mighty expensive hours look at the price the wholesale price of a megawatt hour that's a that's a million watts per hour of electricity the wholesale price of that is fifty dollars normally average but during one of those 72 hours one energy company will charge another ten thousand dollars per megawatt hour. That's Australian dollars. Wow! That is just a crazy way to work. What a waste of capital and infrastructure. If we could redo this, we could use, we could uh, uh, allow more energy and manage the whole process more effectively. And the ways to do it is so easy. What you do is you install automatic meters, smart meters. What happens is we say, uh, we say, to, uh, um, we say to Edgar, Edgar, uh, we know your factory produces frozen fish. Uh, we're wondering if we could do a deal. Uh, could, you, could you together with us put more insulation around your deep freezers so that you can turn and keep your system running cool. We can tell you which days it is. When it looks like the weather's going to get really hot, we'll tell you the day before, and we want you to reduce the temperature from minus 15 to minus 22. Why? Because we want permission to shut off your electricity supply for up to six hours on all your freezers. Are you up for that? And you say, sure. How much are you going to pay me per regular hour? Say, well, we could pay you 10 thousand dollars per megawatt hour and still make a lovely profit. Now, could this work? Yes, it could. Is the technology here? Yes, it is. I'm not telling you the future. I'm telling you history. You tell me tomorrow. I'm saying these opportunities are just sitting there for the asking. Biofuels. This is a controversial area. 20 million acres were lost in 2007. Uh, to produce grain. 18% of the 2008 US grain went towards biofuels, burning food to make fuel. The EU is looking to uh, uh, combine a, a, big, a big element, whether you like it or not, you will have to burn a certain amount of food in your car from 2010. I hope you're happy about that because you haven't got any choice. Now, one of the challenges is, remember the future isn't about science, it's about emotion which is connected with what people believe and we have biofuel companies here so this is a very important issue to them I was talking to you earlier and what we saw was a massive spike in food prices which just happened to coincide with the one-fifth of the American um, grain crop going towards uh, cars is it a problem well you could say yes um, in fact, we saw uh, riots in these countries. I was talking to the Pentagon about this particular issue not so very long ago, about how to reduce international conflicts in the future. I have to say biofuels and the US policy and the EU policy on burning food in cars scored up there. 
Um, remember, the future isn't about whether the food price was really related to it. It's only a question of perception. But perception is strong because on the 28th of April, the UN itself put out this press release, Crime Against Humanity. The United States and the European Union have taken a criminal path by contributing to an explosive rise in fuel and food prices through using food crops to produce biofuels. Correct? Incorrect? Who cares? The reality is riots in 33 countries over food. The reality is Hardly a single biofuels manufacturer can hold their head up high in the current climate if they tell you that most of their biofuel comes from corn or wheat or soybean or anything else. The reality is that American foreign policy will be forced to change. The reality is you can see that EU policy may have to follow. So we need to be wise. Remember the future is not about innovation. It's about innovation that makes sense in the emotional climate that we're in. So generating, um, I'll go through this quickly because most of you are much more familiar with these areas than I am. A wind power, we know this is, you know, this is a, sale, a payback period of five years. We're expecting 100,000 small turbines a year and they can be big. In the Texas, uh, there's a one gigawatt unit of power that's being built right now. By the way, who pays for these things? McDonald's decided recently to install solar cells and a wind turbine on the top of every single McDonald's in America. How much do you think it will actually contribute to their energy? Almost zero. What will the cost be? Unbelievably high compared to the number of units they save because it's not on, our, on an industrial scale. So why did they did it and who paid the budget? It's there. The PR department and the marketing department paid for it because they thought it was just good for the corporate image. So watch out, you may find interesting sources of funding if you're trying to sell things. Don't always assume that it's done on cost savings. Um, we've seen tremendous growth in the European Union and we will continue to see, I think, at least 30% growth per year in turbine technology. Denmark uh, gets 90% from wind already. Germany, 6%. The cost is down at a wonderful figure of 4 pence a unit. Great. Wind turbine sales per year. We could be talking in the UK at least 20,000 units per year and they're 80 meters long these blades. Can you imagine that? That's almost a hundred meter race in an Olympics just to get down the length of one of these turbine blades. That must be twice as long as from the corner of this room right to the end and far beyond. That's the length of them which means it's a local business. It's one business the Chinese, the Vietnamese and the Japanese are not going to take away from you here in Switzerland. If you want to make it, you can build it and ship it to Munich and no one can compete. It's difficult to ship an 80 meter blade in one go and they have to be formulated in one complete length. This is aircraft technology, high tech, interesting, highly profitable and as you can see, almost infinite demand at the moment if you get the price right. Payback period is so short, you just lend them the money and then collect the savings. What about sunlight? Look at this. You know, 7,000 times our entire power needs in the whole world comes to the earth in sunlight every single day and every watt is free and it's always there somewhere. You would only have to put an array over a relatively small chunk of the desert in the United States of America to produce all the energy America needs. Only one problem, which is it's in the wrong place. So we need new technologies and distribution. And some companies here will go and invest in this. We need to forget the old grid. The old grid is AC, which is, it goes positive, minus, positive, minus, positive, negative, positive, negative, 50 times every second. We need DC lines. It's a completely different grid. We need it like yesterday. And tens of millions, hundreds of millions of pounds will be spent regridding whole chunks of the developed world and it could be your technology and companies that provide the components for it. Who's in this business? Put your hands up if you're in that business. One, two, this is big stuff and governments will pay for it because they have to. Because without it, you can't do solar and you can't do wind on anything like the large enough scale to get the distance. Solar cells. Solar cells, you know, the one thing that could change solar cells tomorrow is this. 
volume. The only reason why it's expensive is because the volumes are too small. Um, John here designs whole cities. That's what he likes to do. If John was to design a new city as an extension of Dubai for another 50,000 people and was told by, uh, by the powers that be that 80% of every surface across every car park, every building, the lining of every building, everything that doesn't actually have to pass light through it as a window, 80% of all surfaces have to be solar, which could happen just like that. And if Germany was joined, Germany's already done some of this stuff by offering you, I think, 50 cents per unit for all the electricity you sell back to the, government, to the, to the national grid, but it only costs you 10, 10 cents a unit to buy it. So it's a, uh, something like that. It's a three or four times uh, differential. If the UK and Spain and Italy and France were all to join the German picture, not without any government subsidy, but just like uh, uh, the prince uh, of the royal family in Dubai, just to make one royal decision, one government decree, that 10%, 20%, 30% of the surface of all new roofing has to be solar cells. Finish. No discussion. As we've discussed, it wouldn't add much cost, just like uh, the, uh, the uh, heat pumps. It could happen tomorrow. It would cost almost nothing in terms of design and building cost. And what would happen to the price of these things? Well, firstly, we'd have a big spike because there's no capacity. But secondly, you know what? This is just computer technology. Solar cells are just chips. We've been there before. It's all to do with volume. And with volume, you can get prices down by up to 10% up to of what it is today. So while we're looking at the moment at uh, very high cost, it's certainly reasonable to think we could get electricity generation by solar cell down to 10 cents a unit and with a reasonable payback period. Could it be happen? Put your hands up if you think it could happen. It could just happen. That's not just Germany, but it could be even an EU-wide agree EU agreement within the next decade that this could happen. Say 50% of all roofs, new roofs, solar cell. So who's in the solar cell business? Better start building. You seem to be in everything. <laughs> I think you should be giving this talk, not me. <laughs> okay, nuclear energy, dirty, bad image. Let's have a look at the facts. We're going to see big growth and why. Look at this, I'm sorry, I hope. Uh, let me explain it for those of you who can't see it at the back. The big line at the top is China. This is the number of new nuclear reactors under construction. I just want you to see here at the bottom, this small one is, of course, the United States of America. Almost zero. One nuclear power station. But look at the next graph. This is the other shocking one. This is the number of reactors in operation worldwide. Number top is United States of America. So, in other words, the US used to believe in nuclear, then went off the idea, hasn't built a nuclear reactor in living memory. Actually, nor has the UK. Actually, nor has France. Actually, most countries haven't. You know what? We are heading for a major crisis in the nuclear industry because there is an absolute shortage of human beings that know how to make these things. They're all dead or retired. So we have an urgent need to train up a new generation of nuclear physicists and engineers to build the next generation, which will surely come. And look at this. This is an interesting graph. This is the nuclear share in total electricity generation. That is 80%. And you can see France right up there. That's 76%. Next is Lithuania. Next one down, Slovakia. Next is Belgium, Ukraine, Sweden, Armenia, Slovenia, Hungary, Korea, Bulgaria. Interesting. These are all post-Soviet countries running old power stations. In fact, I was in... The, um, I was in uh, Belarus recently, um, and uh, they have nuclear power. Uh, I was in Latvia just the other day. Latvia was faced with an EU decree to shut down 70% of all their nuclear capacity from midnight within the next four weeks because they fear another Chernobyl. So suddenly that country's plunged into chaos, and by the way, it's not very good for global warming. They're suddenly being asked to take themselves out of a 70% nuclear power into 100% carbon power economy, and most of it bought from another country which will bankrupt them. So these are political issues, but you're going to see lots more about nuclear, and as I say, it's going to be about fission rather than fusion, um, which is, uh, it's going to be, sorry, it's going to be about fusion rather than fission, 
pushing small molecules, small atoms together to make energy under extreme conditions rather than splitting big ones and making all this mess. Fish fusion, we think, is clean. There's already an experimental reactor. It will come online in 2035 without any extra investment, with about $8 billion a year only invested. What would happen if we put $1 trillion a year into it? What would happen if we put just $100 billion? We could accelerate this whole process. A fusion uses the, the, the molecules that are in your battery of your phone, plus a whole load of seawater, things which we have almost unlimited quantities of, to produce unlimited amounts of energy for the whole of foreseeable human existence. That's how big the prize is. Fusion produces minimal fallout in terms of long-term radiation products. Fusion produces zero potential for nuclear abuse and terrorist weaponry. Exciting. And so you can expect to hear a lot more about it. And when you do, if we could crack this, if we could produce with human ingenuity by the year 20, 2100 or before, maybe 2050, a potential source of unlimited power at lower cost than we're used to, much lower cost than we've ever been used to, then you know what? We will solve the water shortage at the same time because we will have the technology to produce water as we need from seawater and all kinds of other things. Now you say, well, I can't get my mind around that. I assure you, ladies and gentlemen, in 1890, it was impossible for people to get their minds around the idea of motorized transport or the telephone or the TV or anything else. Offsetting, very important and controversial area, uh, why? Because it enables you to buy savings in one industry. You might have an expensive process, sir, and it's very difficult for you to save energy. It's going to cost you 500 euros per ton. But for 100 euros a ton, we could buy a huge amount of innovation over here in someone who just can't make a business case. Ernst got close to it, but where the, by the time Stefan had added all his consultancy charges, it just wasn't worthwhile. But you said, no, we'll pay Stefan's consultancy charges, and you say, well, if you do that, we can roll it out. What happens is Stefan then introduces a new process with a payback period of 10 years. You say, we'll provide the capital interest-free loan. St Ernst says, OK, we'll do it. What happens then, he does something which would never have managed to happen without your entrepreneurship. In fact, you did it through a broker. I see Han, it was Han's company, who was the carbon trader, and connected it all together and made this amazing business connection happen. The net result is that your business is now saving over one million tons of carbon dioxide a year. Astonishing. You're shocked even yourself. And you're able to claim it as a carbon credit. In fact, you say, well, I only needed 100,000. I'll sell the rest and go back to Ernst and say, how does she fancy buy 900,000 tons of carbon credit? And you might say, well, that just gives Ernst permission to go on polluting. You say, no, it doesn't. What it does is it provides a non government method of finance. It means that Peter doesn't have to pay for it out of his taxes. So he'd be quite pleased, actually, to find that a grant of 5 million euros went down over here, plus, uh, plus all the rest of it. But there is no market. How should I do this? The market is there. Yeah. There are traders already there, and if, if you think there's no market, go and create a new website. Uh, there are a stack of websites already up there starting to do it. They're linked with people who are energy consultants, to make it all happen. It's, it is huge, and let's look at the size of it. Uh, by the way, uh, look at the differences. Solar cells cost 250 pounds per ton of carbon dioxide. But you could put 10,000 pounds into hydroelectric power to save 700 tons. So it's pretty big. Um, carbon trading will be the world's largest derivative market. Its uh, contracts are growing by over 130% per year and we can expect a carbon trading market of $50 billion a year by 2012. I think that's conservative. Hans, if you want to do it, there's plenty of people that want to take your money. Only one thing I warn you. Be very careful. They don't all deliver what they promise. And the big trick is this. We take your 5 million euros, we go to our good friend over here and say, Klaus, I heard that you've just about to order a nice 
energy saving technology. Is that correct? I say, yes. How much is it going to cost? And you say, well, about five million euros. I said, just don't pay the bill. Just give me a million as an arrangement fee, and then we'll take his five million euros and we'll tell him that we've done the deal and now you're doing extra stuff. The key is additionality. We have to prove, we have to audit it to prove that what you are paying for produces an additional saving over what Ernst would ever have managed to do himself. And that's the big challenge with it. Look at the offsetting calculator. One tonne of carbon dioxide at the moment costs 10 to 15 pounds, 10 to 15 euros to offset in the market. A concrete is one tonne of carbon per tonne of product. A short haul flight is one tonne. An executive car driven 12,000 miles is one tonne. A gas bill of 550 euros is one tonne. So you can work out in your business what your tonnage is and offset. Offsetting is a tremendous thing to do. Any of you can do it tomorrow. In the past, I've offset many of my flights because it enables you to say, I flew today here on water power. My plane is air driven, driven by wind. It's great. It's good for your brand. It's good for your image. It's a, and it's a fantastic business if you want to get into it. And uh, finally, you can remove the gas. That's what we're going to hear a lot about, but it's heavy duty stuff. You suck the carbon dioxide out of the top of the stack and you put it back where it came from. The more gas you liquefy and you push back down onto this, under the earth, back into the old gas formation, uh, the more you raise the pressure in the field and the more oil and, and real gas, burnable gas, you get out again. So it's a double win. Carbon capture market. Uh, by the way, you can burn, if you want to, you can burn your gas in pure CO2, pure oxygen. Use the electricity, suck oxygen out of the air. Push the oxygen into the furnace. Up the chimney comes two things. Water, which you can put into the river, and pure carbon dioxide, which you pump away back under the field. Um, so we can, uh, uh, carbon capture capacity, Canada alone could store 1.3 trillion dollars, uh, 1.3 trillion tons, tons of CO2, enough to last the country 100 years. By 2020, all new coal-fired power stations, according to the EU, have to, have to offer carbon capture. We think that will increase prices uh, per electricity unit by around 1 to 2 pence per kilowatt hour. The cost of capturing will fall dramatically. There are many companies involved. Carbon capture market from 2010 to 2030, I think, is worth $500 billion a year, $1 billion per plant, and a lot of it is fairly small technology. I'm not asking you to go and build a nuclear power station. All we're asking you to do is put a collar around the hot gases that come out, process them, and then put a pump and pump the gas away and, and run a pipe. It's not that difficult. And it will all be screwed up by government subsidies. There's never been a clean market in energy. It's always been miner support and oil uh, dispensation support. Um, and nuclear energy support. So remember, watch out for government policy, and government policy will be affected by emotion, so we watch out for government mood. That's it. And Moore's law is this, innovation is going to come. You remember Moore's law, the number of transistors on a, on, a, on a chip doubles every 18 months. This is a logarithmic scale. This shows a jump from 2,300 transistors in 1971 to 2 billion by 2008. But what happens to human knowledge? If human knowledge in energy doubles, science doubles every year, then in 10 years we will know a thousand times more than we do today. Isn't that amazing? In 20 years we will know a million times more than we do today about something like nuclear fusion. In 30 years, we will know one billion times more than we do today. So when you're saying, well, I'm not sure I can see it, or it require a big step, or a big leap of faith, <sighs> do the maths. Think of the sheer power of human ingenuity and research in these spheres. And some of it will be you. Some of it will be your products, your engineers, your scientists, your patents, your consulting that will change this world. And I'm excited about that. So in summary, I think this is fixable. 
And the biggest winners of all, of course, are the consultants. If any, in every gold rush, and this is a gold boom, it will be a gold boom and a gold bubble and then a gold bust, a, a carbon bust. But in every gold rush, the people who make most of the money have told you where to dig and then charged you an arm and leg to teach you how to dig and then sold you the spade and the shovel and bought the product off you and managed the whole process and when it all ran out, moved you on. And uh, management consulting in this area will be 5% of $40 trillion, uh, which is uh, quite a lot of income for some of you in this room. So, I hope you enjoy the future. As you can see, it's a huge problem, but it is fixable, I believe, with human ingenuity and the kind of, uh, of capacity there is in this room and across this world. Thank you very much.